Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome, wonderful friends of Robert Levine. And um, this is a very exciting evening because Robert is launching his second book and we all love poets, you know, and how could you not love a poet? You have to love a poet. And um, so I just want to welcome you to here. First of all, my name is Victoria Friedman and myself and Ron Friedman, who's one of the squares here, we're co-founders of Vistar View, we're a nonprofit organization and we're dedicated to self-discovery and co-creation and conscious communication. And uh, the way I know Robert, by the way, is through FIONS, Friends of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. We're both on the board of directors there. And somebody earlier said they love working with Robert and I definitely love working with Robert. FIONS is a, um, it's a, it's an amazing organization. It's an organization of organizations. And there are a lot of people in New York that are part of that organization. And over the last, I don't know how many years, seven years or eight years, Robert, but we have done many um, events together. Before, before COVID, we did them live. And so if you can imagine all these leaders of all these organizations were working together. And I have to say, you know, Robert is the one that's always keeping the calm and Everything gets done. He's the treasurer. <laughs> so we really love, he's so dedicated and, and, you know, just really there for us. So everybody at Kay Dundorf is on this call too. She's on the board of Fions. Good to see you, Kay. So I'm going to just, I, I don't know, you probably know all this about Robert, but he is the editor and manager of Trends in Global Grassroots Organization magazine with We the World. And he's a poet an essayist, an activist, a performer, and a yoga instructor. He lives in the New York City area. And he's the author of Without Knowing Where We're Going, 108 Poems. And his latest book, On a Journey, that is what we're celebrating tonight. So in order to just get this going, what we thought we would do is put up a um, image with some words on it, one of, one, uh, one of Robert's poems, and just ask you to have a little meditation contemplation on it. Uh, I suggest that perhaps we invite you to maybe read it slower than you usually read, like read each word. It will take like two minutes to just feel that out because you know Robert's poetry is very impactful and I'm sure, sure most of you know it's very intense. So it's just not something we wanna speed through. So uh, I'm going to put it up and we'll just take a few minutes in silence and look at the poem.
Thank you. Okay, I think Robert, we're ready for you. Thank you, Victoria, so much. And thank you for hosting this event. Um, poetry has been a part of my life for as long as I can remember. Like most of us, I started writing poetry when I was in high school. Um, but it became more than that to me. And I continued writing through college. And But I really became a poet. It was in the early 80s when a very dear friend of mine, Tom Jones, who is one of the people I acknowledge in the book, who unfortunately is no longer with us, passed away nine years ago, kind of sat down with me and said, but you're writing a really lovely song lyrics, but they're not poetry. And I go, well, what is poetry? And he says, well, start reading it and then start writing it. And he was right. Um, so I've now been writing poetry quite seriously. And it was only in the last few years that I've been sharing it with people. I published in a few journals. Um, my good friend, Albert Depa, who put out a journal but quite a few years ago now. And um, in Trends Magazine, which I now edit, as well as in um, Light on Light, which was which is produced by one of our fellow board members. But it's only in the last few years when I put out 108 poems without knowing where we're going that I realized how important it was for me to share my work and let people read the work and let them find whatever they could find in it. Um, this book is exists because of so many people and I'll wait till the end to thank all of them, but I wanna share a few poems with you. The poem Victoria shared with us was an earlier poem, some, someplace in the 1980s. And my, the current volume includes poems from the early 80s up until a few months ago. So it's about as comprehensive a collection of my work that currently exists. So I wanna share two poems with you. One that was from an earlier period of my writing and the other one from maybe about 20 years ago. And if I, we have time, a short one that's more current. This first one's called Strolling. It was written in the early to mid eighties. Children may remember four shots at a 24 hour newsstand in Brooklyn, how the ambulance came late. Remember Washington Irving sitting by his dining room window regretting the coming of the train to his estate. I'm sitting on his estate, on a hill above the Hudson, listening for the trains, looking for the dolphins swimming up river. On the grass beside me, a woman is asleep, her camera by her hand, my back to Sunnyside as I remember bathroom love scenes a flight to Boston and I'm sitting by the window with my legs crossed wondering, what happens to the wheels as the plane takes off? So that's strolling. And I'd like to now share a poem that was from around 2000 and 2000, 2001. It's actually, though it's not mentioned in the text, it's dedicated to my yoga teacher training class of 1999, of which one of the members, Andre, is here this evening. It's called Dreaming on the Barricades. Each step a journey, a pilgrimage uptown, a journey through a universe of misunderstanding. Each step a journey, a meditation, a pilgrimage, not to India, not to Jerusalem, a journey uptown through the streets to the subway to meadow as the buildings turn to liquid and dolphins swim north towards sounds of chanting and drums. Each step of meditation, a showing of intention without space, without time, each word spoken, not for the ear, but to penetrate 
to reawaken each cell, each organ to a new communion of bodies and minds. The moon draws and, and we follow to the path where it was born, first carved and floated into the sky. A string of light shines into my eyes, pulling me up while the glow that surrounds it gently presses my shoulders to the ground. Grounded and uplifted, we follow with each step sacred, each step the first, each step the last, to the crater that remains filled with water and reflections. A small island restlessly floating, paying homage to its origins. We approach in a state of restful excitement, each step sloping, pressing, eyes never leaving the moon, to the wooden bridge that brings us to the center of the island. As the moon withdraws, set in darkness, we stand in a circle, dancing a sacred hokey pokey to the goddess. And for the last poem that I'll be sharing at this moment is a more recent poem called Summer Song. It was written in a meditation. While we were home for COVID, I started meditating again and really came to relish it and realize how much I missed it. And this poem came to me in a meditation entitled Summer Song. By grace, soft lips brush my cheek as I find myself flying feeling nothing beneath me and everything around me. My eyes open at first with fear gripping my limbs and within until I see that I am moving in the cosmos, stars and planets, vast spaces of light and dark. And I am embraced by wonder. And I wanted to share those three poems with you. Because until I put this book together, I didn't quite realize how much in common my poetry has had. There's been a very central vision um, of the world, of the spirit, of the heart, and they're always combined. There are no barriers between public and private. It's all comes together for a, for a, for a vision of a very holistic universe. And that I, that I came to realize was reflected in the poems I wrote in 1980s, as well as in the 2020s. So I'm glad I could share those poems with you. And I'm very excited that you're here this evening and um, that some of my dear friends are here today as well, who are also going to share some of these poems. So um, Victoria, I'll just introduce our first non-me reader. Um, one of the people who will be reading this evening, reading one of my poems is Marina Zogby. I have the good fortune to know Marina these last few years. We, we act together, we take acting. She's been an acting partner. I've done some amazing scenes with her. She's a talented writer and talented actor. So Marina, thank you for being here this evening and thank you for reading one of the poems. My pleasure, Robert. It's a lovely poem, and I'm really happy to read it. Synecdoche, within a breath. I stumbled on the universe on a cold winter's night in 1979. The portal right in front as I stepped through was all around me, above, below, on all sides, Sides I did not see, nor feel, nor imagine. My hand, the lamppost, the street, the sky, came apart and joined together. Particles dancing, playing with each other, disappearing and appearing, along with one another and themselves. Not in any time or any place, not in any space, but in every corner of the universe, in every universe, at any and all points in time, with all beings, 
corporeal or not, with all that was and wasn't, until it all came together in the moment, at a time, in space, as I stood there, the light wind brushing my face, looking into the night sky over New York. That was beautiful, Marina. Absolutely beautiful. Robert, that was fantastic. I just think, oh, beautiful. I'm glad we're recording this. This is so good. Okay. Well, um, I think I think we're about to, are you ready for the dialogue now with Ron? I'm going to introduce Ron. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Ron Friedman. And uh, Ron, uh, I know him very well. I know him for 57 years. So. <laughs> I know him really well. Um, so Ron uh, is, um, by uh, profession, Ron was a pathologist, one that follows paths. So he was a pathologist and um, he became a poet <laughs> somewhere along the line. It just happened in a very miraculous way. And so that's what he's, you know, been doing and we've been working on in Vistar View together for many years. And, communication and many other wonderful events. And uh, I was speaking with Karen, I said, what's it like to live with a poet? Because I just feel like I'm living with Hafiz, you know, because like in the morning, Ron like is doing the dishes and all of a sudden, you know, my sink is a temple, <laughs> you know, the sink is a temple, the water running is some kind of a waterfall. We're being visited by I, I don't know, spirits from everywhere. And so, you know, this is what I have to put up with. I mean, just <laughs> get a little sympathy here. So yes, so Ron um, is a man of many talents and he's been through an incredible journey. And I think it'd be wonderful for Ron and Robert to come on now and uh, I'll highlight you both and perhaps you can grace us with a dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. And uh, let's talk about the ineffable. Let's talk about what can't be talked about. Let's talk about what <laughs> inspires poetry, which I think we both love. So Robert, I mean, one of the things we wanted to talk about was the poetic experience itself. You know, how, how does it happen? What are the questions that come with the actual creative act? How do you find it? Because it's something that's been fascinating to me. I've written a lot about it. Uh, my background as a physicist always looks at what is going on, how, why. So what does it look like to you, the creative act of poetry? Whatever, what would you like to say about it? Well, I love the way you introduced it because for me, poetry, it comes, it just comes to me, it, it visits. It's in there, it's in the atmosphere. And when I allow myself to open up, when I'm alive to the moment, can quiet my brain, it comes. It's usually for me, it comes in the form of music, not always, but most times. I'll start to hear it first as a song. And then you know, I've, I've written a few songs, two of which are included in the book, but it first comes to me as a song. And then the words start coming. The music is there, the words are there. And then I see them start shaping and then I have to shape it. I become actively engaged with it, which is why my previous book, um, without knowing where we're going, I just let the poems come and left them. Didn't edit, didn't let them be in the moment. But usually I then allow myself to sit with it, to see what form it takes, let, let it settle in. It's sort of like making French onion soup, which I did recently when we were visiting some friends. You're putting all of the ingredients together and I tend to wing it, I wing most things. And, but I always knew with French onion soup that you've got to let it sit. You've got to let it take its time to find its flavor. And like French onion soup, 
That's how I've always felt about my poetry. They've, it's got to, it has to come together. It's got to find its way. Then I've got to find my relationship to it. And that can come in many fashions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, many times my experience is comes fully formed, it's still steaming. It's an identified flight object, which has just landed. And uh, there's enough of it there that I can start writing. But sometimes, sometimes there is an experience which is, stays around and demands, I think as you were saying, it mm -hmm. demands, it demands manifestation. And I circle around it because I'm respectful of it, but I don't want to touch it until it's come together in a way that is honest to the source, to the feeling where it came from. So, and that may end up, it's a very, very short poem. As a matter of fact, I find lengthwise that my poems are getting shorter and shorter. So has anything happened to the length of your poems? Have you noticed an evolution in the poem, although you said that the content is very, very similar when you look at it across the years? Well, they've, I, I think I've had a similar experience to you because a lot of the longer poems in here are from about 15 to 20 years ago. Um, my poems, in a sense, are now in a more concentrated form. I used to feel I needed to, I let the words, in previous work, I let the words take over. The words became the focus, and I wanted words in there. And, you know, poet, words, they kind of go together. And I wanted the words, I wanted the more focused images. But then as the work evolved, and the experience evolved, and I became more confident in the vision, in the vision of the poem, I've started to let the poem speak for itself, let it come together. So I even had, had one poem in the collection, it's just four lines. Um, but yeah, they tend to be shorter and more, you know, let the vision sort of become, I don't want to say pure, but pure. Yeah. So it makes a difference. Yeah, I have one short poem, which I won't read now, but it talks about calculus as if a poetry is a certain kind of calculus that approaches a limit. It converges on a limit as calculus does, and that limit ultimately is silence. Um, for example, the isness of nowness needs no rearrangement. It's perfect order, speaks volumes in silence. So that was one that took me quite a while to put down. I thought it would be a longer poem, but it came together, as you say, in a very, very short final version. But while we're talking, I think one of the things that we did mention we want to talk about is what do you make of the source of the poem? How do you put that together? Do you have a name for it? Do you leave it unattended by name? I don't know if I'd have a name for it, um, but it comes from the source of my poetry. It comes from genuine, genuinely being in the world as, as as genuine me without all of the peripherals that we build in our lives, things, all the definitions of how we define ourselves. As I let that strip away, melt away, what is, what is essentially me and my relation to the universe, because my poem is very much my connection to the universe. It's somewhat, it's somewhat metaphysical. So it's, so it's my connection, for lack of a better term, to the divine. Yes, 
Americans. How could it not be somewhat metaphysical, <laughs> especially for someone like you? Uh, I found that I had to come to grips somehow with the source of the poem. And I ended up rather calling it unknown, unexpressible, et cetera, et cetera. I called it the muse. It made it much easier for me to deal with. And um, if you will, I have a very short poem of my relationship to the muse. Please. Um, let's see, it's somewhere here. All right. Uh, I should mention that I regard Rumi and Hafiz as some of my mentors. So there is sometimes a somewhat sacred irreverence which creeps into the poetry, uh, which I ask everybody's understanding. Early in the morning, still half asleep, a Mona Lisa smile on my face, I watched that realm of creation dancing and strutting its virtuosity before me, freely offering wonderful, wordful creations for my delighted, bemused, enchanted consideration. Like, very perhaps, or possibly certain, making my smile wider and wondering why we label that realm of creation darkness by the mind, when surely of a possible certainty, it is very perhaps the most enlightened darkness of our multidimensional being. So <laughs> um, that really refers to Another aspect of the poetic creative experience, which is when does it happen? Right. Does it happen in any particular place? Is there some uh, state where it is more accessible than others? There's actually just sort of reminding me of a very short poem I wrote a few years ago. Is something I was doing with Fions, and all of us were writing something to go and um, the magazine Light on Light, we were all asked to write something about ourselves. So I wrote a poem. And this was a very short poem, but I think it says a lot. And then I'll, because I think I can more fully answer the questions. It's called Mysteries. Embedded in all mysteries, alive to the touch, the sharing, the knowing and unknowing of living, ever so present in the flow. And I have a picture, if folks can see this on page 72 of the book. I have a picture of dusk here, of sunset. It's at those moments when I feel the walls between time and the universes, between day and night, when they break down, when they seem to not break down, when they seem to haze and they flow into each other. You go into the flow, when the borders are no longer there, or when they become porous. That I find the inspiration. And it's when I can let down my borders and my connection. So the poem that Marina shared sort of just described an experience I had where I truly experienced that there was no, that I was connected to the universe and I was with, and with everyone and everything. It, there, were, there were no borders. So it's at that edge. When the edge can go, that's when my creativity becomes most alive. Exactly. I fully agree. I mean, for me, one of the times when the borders fade is between waking up, just waking up from sleep. In that moment, whether you're ne neither asleep nor awake, and mm -hmm. it's kind of a place where you haven't identified yourself yet. You don't exactly know who you are. You don't know where you're going to land when you fully open your eyes. But at that moment, poetry loves to unfold itself. It has that freedom 
of non-identification where it can reveal its rhythm. It can reveal its rhyme most easily. It's one place for me. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, I totally shared my experience. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really beautiful. There's a whole other element that intrigues me, which is how is it that you hear the poem as a music that becomes words eventually? But even before the music, there is an impulse in another language which needs to be brought down to this dimension and spread out, spread out so it can be read. But the original impulse, I love to look at that and stay with that and realize that the source of the poetry for me is another language, completely different language. You describe it as music. I wonder if you've ever thought about the incredible density of feeling and form and rhythm that exists in this other realm that opens itself up in the form of the musical inspiration and then the written poem. Well, for me, it's, I mean, I was raised in some ways, in some ways not in very traditional male in American society in the 60s and 70s. And we saw the barriers break down thanks to feminism and the great feminist theorists, but raised with certain ways about emotion, how we handled emotion. It's in that impulse, the music, the poetry, that the emotion was most accessible to me. Being in the world and feeling about the world, in a sense, the music opened me up. It, I think the poetry was there. It was trying to find its way in and I realized music, as we all learned, because I'm also, last many years, I've been a singer. The music just sort of, we come alive in the singing, in the music. And it breaks down our defenses and we let go. I mean, even if anyone, I think everyone should sing. I don't care if you don't think you have a good voice or not, everyone should sing. Because it opens you up and it just lets loose and it creates an openness for things to come in, very wonderful things. Emotions, it could be powerful emotions that sadness or whatever, but it just opens you, it frees you. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would say like the other thing, which I think is common to many of us is the opening that occurs through gratitude. Mm -hmm. Gratitude itself is a doorway. It's a multifaceted doorway into creativity. I found this. Um, so much so that when I sit down to write in my favorite place, often gratitude interrupts whatever I'm going to do next, including meditation. It just comes in and reveals itself. And in that expression, which is itself a mystery, gratitude is a mystery because mm -hmm. what are we when we respond to what? On what altar do we place our gratitude? It's really a mystery when we come down to it. But yeah, and it isn't right, and it isn't gratitude that all things become possible. Yes. Yes. That's great. Victoria, have we used up our time? Because I we could go on. We could go on. I'm, I'm warning you. No, I think we're ready um for the next reader. That, that Robert is going to tell us about, but thank you for that. That was so beautiful. You two are so linked. This is Robert and Ron, you know, <laughs> Ron and Bob, <laughs> just beautiful. Thank you. So if I may, Victoria, I'd like to introduce the next reader. Yes. Um, another dear friend, a very um, lovely open man. We, we act together and uh, very proud to call him a friend. David um, David Baird. So David, thank you for being here this evening. Oh, you have to unmute yourself, Dave. Duh. <laughs> I am so flattered and grateful that you've asked me to participate. This is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> 
So you've asked me re to read a poem called Frame of Mind, written September 6th, 2001. I often imagine that the world is on fire. Big cartoon flames behind the buildings, consuming them without touching. How long does it take before we know that someone is missing or dead or just on vacation? How many phone calls or letters sent before there is no answer? I've been calling you now for three or more weeks, all times of the day. Not too late, you could be sleeping. Each time, 10 or 11 rings with no communication. I search out memories instead. Memories not shared, but retold. A narrative that is looping and twisting from city to decade, to motion, arms swinging. A body sitting in a car or on a couch, drunk or sober. A bookstore, now closed for more than 20 years. I often imagine that the world is being swallowed by water. Large, massive waves hovering older over buildings before they crash on down. and engulf me. Where'd you go? <laughs> Where is everybody? <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. So I'm still kind of getting over that. That was beautiful. What, what, this, is what I, this is what I really wish poets would do, that they would perform their poetry like that. That was amazing, really. Just wonderful. Okay. It's in the words. Okay, are we done with, uh, is David done? Robert, did you want to say something? Just to thank you, David. And I, I love, I love how you read that. You and Marina both, both captured the true essence of each of the poems that you read. And, uh, it's, it's very satisfying to me to hear other people reading my work. I think I think I get to appreciate it more. <laughs> read it. Um, so this is something I'm going to want to do next time I have a live book reading. I'm not going to read a single poem. I'm just going to pass my book around and, and let people read it to me. So, yeah. That was beautiful. Thank you again. Okay. All right, so, um, well, I think we can see why, I don't know, if people have read James Allen, As a Man Thinketh, actually they're putting out a new one, As a Woman Thinketh. <laughs> now, after many years, it's kind of a legendary book in the spiritual world. And um, 
and he says the poets are the saviors of the world. Without them, humanity would perish. And uh, I really think that's the case. I, I really do. I think that, you know, there's this whole thing that I've heard a little bit of Ron speaking about, about po poets that rhyme everything. And there's all sorts of forms that I don't know anything about. But there's just something when somebody says it's a poem and then they read it, there is just something so different than, you know, than just um, reading something in prose or doing a lecture. It's just different. Something is different. Just in, in the sense of the way that was gotten, the way it was being said, and not to say that people don't write, do beautiful lectures and write prose and, and speak beautifully, but it's just different. And uh, I always remember a long time ago, when, one night I, I was lying on my bed and I was reading a book called The Triune Brain, okay? <laughs> the Triune Brain about the, the reptilian brain or something, I can't remember. Anyway, and I, inside me, there was this kind of state of um, like mild depression, maybe anxiety, dissatisfaction, you know, the usual. So that's what was happening. And on the side of my bed was were these other books, because of course I have a lot of books on the side of my bed. So I picked up a book from Rumi and I read a Rumi poem. And I can't tell you which poem I read, and it doesn't matter because within one minute, I was on the ground, on my hands and knees, crying, thanking, whatever power there is for the beauty of life. That's what would happen. So, I mean, it is just such a powerful, powerful thing, the poetry. And, you know, Ron and I have a big background in, in poetry in the sense we had an ensemble that performed uh, Rumi poems and, and did presentations for eight years, 12 people. And um, one of the, one of the po I wanna do one poem for all of us from, um, one of the poets that we, um, we, we worked with, and her name is Mirabai. You've heard that name or you know her poetry. She was a Rajasthani princess. She was gonna be a, a queen. She was married and um, she's a legend, a legend. That's why you get all those names from Mirabai in India. And she, she was married and she lived in a beautiful palace, except when she got married, she actually said that she, she, was, she was already married to Krishna, the blue skin God. So that turned out to be a little bit of a problem, but that happened on the way. So Mirabai, she would sneak out at night out of her window and go down, go in the streets and walk among, you know, those were probably the, the um, poets of those times. They were probably the slam poets, then they were the hippies. They were <laughs> all the great mystics and the sadhus wandering in the streets, singing songs to Krishna, to, to the beloved. And so Mirabai went and did that. And of course, the family found out they were not very happy. They were not happy at all. And there are many legends how they tried to get her to come back. And um, there's one particular one uh, that what happened is they came to, to kidnap her on a donkey. And this is her poem about, um, about that situation, okay? The name of the poem is, Let Me Tell You Why Mira Can't Go Back to Her Old House. Let me tell you why Mira cannot go back to her old house, okay? The colors of the dark one have penetrated Mira's body. All other colors washed out, making love with the dark one and eating little. Those are my pearls and cornelians, barbs and forehead streaks. Those are my meditation beads. That's the feminine wiles for me. My teacher taught me this, approve me or disapprove me. I praise the mountain energy day and night. I take the path ecstatic human beings have taken for centuries. I don't steal money. I don't hit anyone. What will you charge me with? I have felt the sway of the elephant's shoulders. And now you want me to sit on a donkey? Try to be serious. Try to be serious. That's Mirabai from many, many years ago. And I just love it. She kind of says it for everybody that's taken a path that's a little bit offbeat. And by the way, a woman doing this, the story of her is, her story is amazing. It's really amazing. So let's see, Robert, where are we now in our, <laughs> in our um, right here? Oh, Karen. Okay, we're gonna bring on Karen because she's gonna tell us a little bit 
about the photographs and her, her time with this poetry and this poet. Well, if I'm gonna be spending time telling folks about my time with this poet, it's gonna take us far longer than the couple of minutes that I've been allotted because I've known Robert now almost 40 years. And the smartest thing I ever did was marry him. I've always said that it's still true today. But my process with the book, our process with the book, this book, the same as the previous one was to put in photos and artwork to support the written word because what we want to do is to make it beautiful for the eye to see as well as beautiful for the ear to hear. This really is an art book. So what, I mean, this was a joint venture with Robert and I, Robert did the writing of course, but when it was time for the poet, for the photos, the photos as, as Robert was mentioning before is my photos, his photos, and one photo from a friend of ours. And we, I looked at the poem, I picked out the photo and with his permission, put it in. And with the hope that it does exactly what I wanted it to do, which was to add and support and make beautiful the words. So that's really, that's really it. Yeah, so I'm going to jump on for one second because I just, I mean, when I write, when I write, the idea of putting together a book is very overwhelming to me because the words are something that's, that's what I deal with in the words, but Karen has an amazing eye. So whenever I've designed anything and put the book together, um, you know, I know, I mean, it's, I mean, Karen's a very talented writer on her own. She's the long form writer. I'm the short form writer in the family. Um, but she has an incredible eye for how things come together for presentation, for photography. She's also a wonderful photographer. So I always know I could turn to her, but I wanna make this book really, really lovely. I want people to not only read it, but to look at it, to treasure it. And she, um, guided me, helped me come up with a cover of both books and this book with the photographs, just instinctively knowing which, you know, of course she felt this was my book. So she made sure that as she said that I was involved in the process, but she has an amazing eye and a, an, an amazing creative sense that I value. And that I think has really made this book very, very special. Thank you. Okay. And she's one of the people this book is um, dedicated to. Well, thank you, both of you. Both of you, a beautiful collaboration and uh, let's do more. Let's do more of them. This is really wonderful. So if you want to get Robert's book, it's really easy. <laughs> you just have to go on Amazon. There it is on Amazon. I don't have the link, but maybe somebody will just put it into chat. I just dropped it in again. But if you just put the title of the book in, or even Robert Levine, the, the car it. locks automatically. Oh yes, yes. I'm going to write something to these lovely people. Okay. <laughs> somebody is muted. I think it's I think it's Robin. Um, so yeah, you can get it there. Also, I think it might be on Robert's Facebook page. You know, maybe there'll be a link there because I know that there's a um, invite to this event. So. I think there might be something there. And um, if it's not, we'll put it on. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I think you can find it there. Uh, so I think it's time for Robert to say a few finishing words here, finishing statements. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I want to especially take this time to thank Sir Peel. First of all, I want to thank every one of you for being here and for making this a very special event. There are um, a number of people who wrote to me and said they couldn't be here, so I'm glad we're recording it because it, it takes a lot of support and a lot of wonderful people over time who have supported my work, who've supported me both, both as friends, family, 
and um, my creativity, but there's certain people I want to highlight today. One who's not with us is Tom Jones, who I mentioned before, the one who taught me to be a poet and whose presence I miss every day. And, and, and anyone who really knew Tom knew what a special person he was. He was also a writer. His books are probably very hard to find, but it was just an incredible voice. I wanna thank Karen um, for her support of my poetry. I would not have continued with my creating without her support. I would like shy away from it. I didn't think it was anything special. It was just so natural to me. And same with my singing. So it's her incredible support. I want to thank Victoria for hosting this, for her support as a friend and colleague, Ron. Also, also this book actually wouldn't exist if it wasn't for one very dear friend, Jude Walsh, who's also been such a supporter of my work for decades. Um, she basically came to me and said, why don't you put out a book of the rest of your poetry? She even had poems, copies of poems that I wrote that I forgot that I wrote. So she sent them to me and through her support and her encouragement, this book came together. I wanna to thank Marina and David. Thank you so much for reading, for being part of this event. Um, thank you to all the friends that have been part of it because writing is, it's my work, it's my creativity, but it's a creative process. Everything, I think everything everyone does is a creative process. We don't, you can create sitting alone, but the poetry really comes alive, for me at least, really comes alive when I get to share it with others. They get to read it and now I learned having them read it to me. So thank you all. Um, I hope you do buy the book, not just because I like when people buy things that I wrote, but I think it's very special and I wanna share it with as many people as I can. And you have any questions, any, write to me, you can't find it, write to me. And for anyone who buys a copy, when I see you, I will be so glad to inscribe it. I got a chance to do it today through my friend Harriet, uh, uh, Harriet Halper, and she, she had a copy. It was actually the first copy of the book I saw. I finally got my copy this evening when I got home. And um, also this copy, Robert, if you show, Robert, show it to everybody. Ah, so thank you, Karen. So this is it. And this is, if you buy it soon, this is a very special edition. This may be a collector's item one day because there's a typo on the back that I'm trying to correct. So if you get this, this might be, you know, how they say that was the edition with that one typo and it's like, a, it's a rarity. This might be a rarity, so. Now's your chance. So thank you all, um, so value you. And why don't we have everyone come on, come on for a few moments, um, go back to um, gallery view. And if anyone would care to say anything, uh, you know, I welcome it, but don't feel obligated. I just wanna thank everybody as well. It's so lovely to see friends and family joining us. I, I would just like to ask the poets amongst us to come up with a better word than now. It's a challenge. Well, interesting. Interesting that you should say that. I don't know if a single word can capture it, but my problem with now is the second you, you say now, it's not now. <laughs> That's why we got to have a better word. <laughs> so now it doesn't exist. So somebody um, I used to know said, it was just, it's included in one of my poem, be, it is being present in the flow. It's not one word, but being present in the flow. So I can't take full credit for that, but I do quote it. I think Harriet has raised her hand. Harriet. <laughs> hey, Harriet. Hi. Well, I am not a poet, certainly not a I enjoy poetry and I enjoy music and 
I, I've lived in California for 40 years. I'm a second cousin of Karen's and Robert's. Robert's part of my family. And I'm very lucky to be one of their students. They have a chair yoga class on Friday. So that's how I heard about all this. Um, I wanted to, uh, you and Ron, um, Robert and Ron, were talking about gratitude. And mm -hmm. one of the groups that I'm in, it's called Musar, although Jewish, it's primarily was started by rabbis probably in the 1700s, but I think all people practice it. And one of the things that people, it, there was, it's called Midot, there are certain traits. There are 13 traits that people should try and incorporate in their lives to uh, make them better people. And one of them is gratitude. And of course, a lot of things in religion, like if you sit down to eat a meal and have a piece of bread, you say a prayer over the bread, that's gratitude. So I find that that's a very positive thing, even when a lot of things in this world are going crazy. <laughs> you just have to remember to be grateful for what you have. And it was really a pleasure listening and mind expanding to this um, event today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. So if anyone else would like to say anything before we bring it to a close? I, I was hoping I could ask a question. Hello. Sure. Um, so I wanted to hear a little bit about process and from that first inspiration through first draft, through polished, published copy, what are some of the steps and trials and tribulations that you go through to get it there? So, I mean, yeah, it, it really does vary. Um, Noam is also a writer that we've known for many years, a uh, friend for many years. Um, you know, there are the rarities, there are the rare poems that come together pretty much whole, needs a little polishing, but there are some poems that, you know, they have to kind of be there. They have to kind of be present and I've got to be present with it and read it and reread it. To a point where even with some of these poems, some of them I wrote more than 20 years ago, as I was reading them again, going through, you know, the book, I realized that some things I wrote back then just didn't seem, the, the tone wasn't there, the, the lack of, you know, I'll say the music wasn't there, and, and I had to make changes, because the poems, not only am I changing, but the poems change. I've, you know, and I've got to respect them that they have an existence of their own. You know, you know, Wordsworth wrote one of his poems he kept on rewriting and rewriting um, for decades. Um, you know, some people argue the original version was the best, but I think each each different version was, you know, true to the true to the Wordsworth that wrote it. And the poems that I did change, and I didn't make a lot of changes, but the poems that I did change, they were, the, as they existed back then, it was true to the Robert of whenever, the 20-something-year-old Robert, the 30-something-year-old Robert, the 40-something Robert. And the, the changes were more true to the, to the Robert that exists right now. So it's got to, you know, it's basically allowing the, poet, the poetry to find its, to find its path. And, be, and there's some poems I've never been able to find. There's one I do include in the book. I still remember I wrote this beautiful poem. My computer crashed. I lost it. Um, I could not recreate it for the life of me. I did not remember it. I did not save a copy anywhere. Um, so I kind of wrote a poem based on it, but, a, it, but it wasn't the same poem. Because that poem, just it just did not want to be rewritten. Did not want to. It said you had your chance, guy. You blew it. So you know, Robert, can I say something uh, very briefly? Please. Uh, and I think Victoria mentioned it, but the need for what David and Marina did is really very, very important. I mean, we have to face the truth that poetry uh, is 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 an outpouring of the soul and has very personal imagery in it, which the listener needs 
to be able to take in. And I think the acting is a crucial part of bringing it across. Uh, I think poetry would be much more uh, listened to and received if acting accompanied it. So uh, I just want to make that point. Um, in our theater troupe, we worked a great deal with Rumi's poetry of trying to bring it across by understanding it from the gut and bringing it out uh, through acting on the stage. And so uh, I'm really appreciative of what David and Marina contributed. As am I, thank you. Thank you, Ron. Um, our Robert, this is Jerry Hinkin. Um, I think after you retire, you have another career as a teacher, a writer in residence, high school, college, groups. Um, not only are you a successful, honest writer, but you're a good listener too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add a, about the book. I think the book came together beautifully. I haven't had a chance to really read it, but I was thumbing through and looking at the pictures. And um, I think the pictures really do help tell the story and bring it together. It um, definitely like influenced and you know brings something to how I feel about the book. And um, I'm looking forward to reading it, especially more so after hearing the poetry read tonight. It read so beautifully and um, yeah, just look forward to it. Thank you. Congratulations, Robert. Thank you, sir. It's, it really is quite wonderful. As has this event been. Mm -hmm. And again, um, you know, Victoria, when I mentioned I was going to do this, she offered that if I wanted her to, she'd help me plan it. Cause I was just going to have you guys come on and listen to me read. <laughs> That's yeah. I don't know if I'd want to listen to me read for, you know, an hour. Um, so thank you, Victoria. I think this was really beautifully planned and um, really appreciate your contribution. You and Ron. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was really, really wonderful. To do this. Yeah.